Hey guys, welcome to an, another episode of Mac Shoots Film, the YouTube series where I make an idiot of myself and upload it to the interwebs for everyone to see forever. <laughs> just, just kidding. All right, so before we jump into the episode, I do want to give a quick shout out to all of my subscribers. Wow, you guys are freaking awesome. I hit 100 subscribers today. Yeah, I know you guys are like, wow, you have the most subscribers of any channel on, on YouTube. Now, sure, 100's not a lot of anything, right? In the day of gigabytes, billions, terabytes, trillions, 100's nothing. But on YouTube, it's really hard to get more followers and sub subscribers because the commitment from the subscriber standpoint or follower standpoint is greater than any other social media platform. With Instagram, it's double tap, scroll. That's all the time commitment they have to have. A YouTube subscriber says, hey, I'm willing to commit five to 15 minutes of time focused on your content, what you have to say. That's amazing. Uh, thanks so much for that, guys. I really appreciate it. Gonna continue to keep putting out content. All right, so let's get over that stuff. Let's get right what we came here to talk about, the Nikon FE2. Is it gonna focus? It can do it. There it goes. Yes, sir. This little bad boy. All right, let's talk about it. All right, so before I go into why I think this is the best ever Nikon film SLR, I wanna say it's the best film ever Nikon SLR for me. You know, you can't make a bold claim like something's the best ever, probably because it doesn't suit everyone's needs, what they're looking for. Uh, so for me personally, this puts a check in every box uh, that I need in a film SLR, and it helps me do my job or the job that I'm setting out to do with a film camera. So with that preface, let's just get right into it. Just a quick background on the camera itself. The camera was released in 1982. The 80s were, you know, the arms race for film SLR makers. Nikon, or if you're in the rest of the world, Nikon, uh, Canon, Minolta, Pentax, Olympus. And these guys were throwing out amazing cameras back then and putting all the tech that they had available to them in cameras. And the Nikon FE2 is uh, no slouch and no exception to that rule as well, jam-packed with features. So let's just jump right into it. Let's work our way across the top of the camera and then around the front. All, all right. right, so let's just take a quick look across the top of the camera. First of all, let's talk about the film advance lever. This guy here turns the camera on. When it is in the lower position like that, the camera will not fire. So if you have it in your bag, you don't have to worry about you know, cracking off one of the frames inadvertently. Pop that guy out, ready to rock. Now, the thing that got me really excited and drew me to this camera are the numbers on this little knob right here. So this guy, made 1982, has a one four thousandth of a second shutter speed. Guys, one four thousandth. My Nikon F3, one two thousandth. My Nikon FG, one one thousandth. The FE1, the uh, predecessor to this, one one thousandth. That's a problem, guys. Big problem for this guy right here. Sorry, I'm in the flight path of the Phoenix airport and there are 11 billion planes going by. I apologize. All right, so plane has gone by for a minute of a second. We'll, 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 we're gonna power through, guys. We're gonna power through. All right, so four thousandth of a second. They accomplish this by, instead of a cloth shutter or an aluminum shutter, it is a titanium shutter. Uh, I'll show you the B-roll of it. but they carved honeycomb patterns in it, I assume to lighten it. Now, this shutter, titanium, travels at like three milliseconds or something like that. So think of the technology they had to employ to get that piece of titanium moving so fast without just flying apart, right? It's, it's freaking amazing. Um, also, they implemented dampening into this to the point where shutter lockup is not required. There's no shutter slap 
that shutter is properly dampened. You don't need to worry about it, even at one four thousandth of a second. That's awesome. So let me also talk to you why one four thousandth of a second was probably the main selling point for this camera. So let's talk about why one four thousandth of a second is so important to me. And definitely one of the attributes that made it, in my opinion, the best Nikon film SLR ever. So I shoot 400 speed film, right? So my, I can't change my ISO, it's not digital. I'm at 400, which is kind of fast, right? Especially in bright light. Two, whatever your shutter speed is on your camera, that's as fast as that thing's gonna go. You can't make it go faster. So if I'm already running at 400, 400 ISO, 400 speed film, and let's say I was using the Nikon F3, my shutter speed maxed out at 2,000th of a second. If I want to shoot wide open, I shoot portraits mainly, guys. So my camera needs to be able to shoot wide open in daylight with 400 speed film. That means I need a way faster shutter. So with the Nikon F3, I was constantly having to put an ND filter in front of the glass, a negative three ND filter. And basically what that does is, it is like sunglasses for your lens. It artificially darkens the scene, enabling you to shoot wide open, right? Um, but that's, that's a hassle and a chore. I gotta remember to take it. And then it's really difficult to see manual focus through a darkened lens. It made fo nailing focus really difficult. So not only was I having to carry more equipment, I was making it even more challenging to manually focus by shooting a camera that had a max shutter speed of one two thousandth of a second. You know, it's the uh, exposure triangle, right? ISO, shutter speed, and um, aperture. And all, if the two of those are fixed, really all you can co is control is aperture. And I was having to stop way down. Even with the negative three ND filter, sometimes I was stopping down to like four or 5.6. And uh, you know, I'm not interested in photographing a model or a portrait outside and having all of the trees and street garbage in focus. I want you to focus only on that uh, subject, the model, and everything else just to be creamy, blurry bokeh, right? Or bokeh if you're in another country. That's another thing that bothers me. Uh, I'm an American, I say things like an American. Nikon, not Nikon. Bokeh, not bokeh, right? Um, anyway, moving on. So, four thousandth of a sh second shutter speed for me is, is absolutely critical. And I think even if you don't shoot portraits, having more is important, right? You, you should definitely look at what shutter speed that camera has to give yourself more creative options. You may say, oh, I don't care about bokeh, I don't care about blurred backgrounds. One day you might, and if you, if you have limited funds and you're investing in one kit, invest in a kit that's gonna have the bookends of possibilities as far apart as possible, right? Don't buy a camera with the bookends of possibilities here. Have it out here. Use this over here when you grow into your camera. So a lot of people in the film community seem to overemphasize the importance of not having batteries in a film camera body. Guys, the solution's simple carry batteries and keep them like in your pocket to keep them warm if you're in a cold environment. Um, pro photographers using digital, if batteries were really an issue, there would be no pro, pro photographers shooting digital, right? Their cameras run on batteries. They carry more batteries? I mean, I, I do not get this insistence on your film camera not requiring batteries. It's ludicrous, it's 2018. I get it, we want the nostalgia and the retro traits of a film SLR, but we live in 2018. Uh, things are mass produced. You can buy batteries cheap. I bought a uh, 20 pack of LR44 batteries for like $7. You know what, and I, I have a few in every one of my camera bags. Problem solved, problem staying solved, guys, move on. But if it does come down to it and the battery dies, you can shoot it 250th of a second. Just use your, a phone light meter app or a real light meter app. I mean, a device, and just set it in that your shutter is at, stuck at 250, and it'll figure out the rest for you and tell you. Yeah, you tell them your shutter speed's at 250, your ISO's at 400, it'll tell you what aperture you need. Hopefully you have a fast enough lens. Going back across the top, it has TTL uh, flash metering. And not only that, it can sync flash up to 250th of a second. That's pretty amazing for back in the day, back in 82. The 4,000 shutter speed, 
the 250 sync. I mean, the Nikon F3, the most famous Nikon SLR, only has an 80th of a second uh, uh, shutter speed with flash. It only has a max shutter speed of one two thousandth of a second. When the battery dies, it can only shoot mechanically a sixtieth of a second. Strike, strike, strike three for the F3. Continuing across the top, we have the wheel where you set your ISO, all right? You just pull up on this wheel, rotate it whichever way you want it to line up with ISO. And we have an exposure value compensation that you can dial in, and that's what I do. A lot of people will set their ISO to another rating, and that's how they'll knock it a stop over or under. I like to do all of that on my exposure value itself. Um, Maybe I should look into why everyone is setting their ISO to a different value as opposed to just dialing an EV. Do they know something I don't know? Or aren't we accomplishing the same goal? But it's a little more explicit by using the EV uh, setting on your camera, right? Like, so some people are like, hey, I want to shoot Fuji 400 to stop over. They'll set the ISO to 200. I don't do that. I'll set my ISO to 400 and I'll dial in what I want over or under on the EV meter. All right, so going on the back, Viewfinder, I think it has about 93% coverage. So there'll be stuff out of the frame that will ultimately end up in your image. It's good though, right? It's a buffer. I'll take a buffer. Everybody likes a buffer. All right, so we've covered, covered the top deck, right? On off, you have your threaded shutter release if you wanna use a button or a shutter release. Four thousandth of a second shutter speed, mechanically 250, um, TTL flash metering one 250th of a second uh, flash shutter speed. Dial in your ISO here, EV here. This is also your film rewind. Flipping it down to the front. The front's pretty straightforward. We can remove our uh, lens here. We have a timer. Pull it to the right, run to your spot. 10 seconds later, it's gonna snap a shot. It's a dual purpose timer as well. I can just push my finger right there and that's how i lock exposure when i'm in aperture priority set this guy to a focus lock my exposure recompose and bam it's going to maintain those settings so if it's the subject's in like a darker area lock in that exposure for that recompose recompose will expose some of a brighter area if i didn't lock my exposure it's going to reread that exposure and set it for the now new additional light and may potentially underexpose your image. So that's a really cool little feature there. I really dig that. Uh, of course, there's your depth of field preview right there. Going across the bottom, yep, you can use a grip on this. And I think if you do, you can get a whopping 3.1 or two frames per second shooting, but it's a manual focus camera. So, I mean, can you focus? I don't know. Uh, batteries go in here, tripod mount. You'll push this guy right here and that will release the film to enable you to rewind it. And then, you know, your info uh, window on the back, of course. Really straightforward. The Nikon F E2, it's a freaking stout camera, guys. It's small, it feels great in hand. I mean, it's a good looking camera too. I mean, look at this bad boy. Super handsome, right? The silver and the black, so classic and classy. It just looks really good. Um, especially with this 51.2 up there, money. Um, yeah, a great camera guys. But like I said, it's a great camera for me. Buy what works for you guys. The camera needs to meet your needs, but do not buy a camera with bookends of functionality that far apart. Give yourself some room. You're gonna grow into your camera and instead of having to buy a new camera, you can use the one you have that you've already become comfortable with. There are a million planes flying by today. It's ridiculous. So do your research. But before you do your research, just bullet point out what you want in the camera and, and you know, have that here, your search here, and constantly refer back and forth. Let looks and popularity be the last thing on your list that you care about. It's gotta meet your needs from a photography standpoint. 
to enable you to be as creative as you can be when you're out in the field. It's better to uh, have it and not need it than need it and not have it, right? So that's it guys. I'm gonna belabor this point. Really amazing camera, quite possibly the best ever Nikon SLR. Like the FM3A is uh, much more money than the FE2. And really one of the only advantages is it has a 4,000th of a second shutter speed as well, but it can fire that mechanically without a battery. So for all you um, one percenters that live in the Arctic and you're still shooting film and you're like, it's too cold, my battery's gonna go dead, my camera won't work. Well, for you guys, FM3A might work, but for the other 99% of the population, the FE2 is, is the peak. Fast shutter speed, fast flash sync speed, aperture priority, small, robust, I mean, I could throw this thing into this body of water right behind me, and I think it would be okay when I dug it out. Battery life's awesome. I've been shooting it for three months, probably shot 25 rolls through it. No, bat no battery replacement yet. My Nikon F3, I'm replacing batteries in it monthly. It's crazy, I don't know what's going on there. Um, so definitely give this guy a, uh, a look, and we'll see you next video. See ya!